Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Audio Advice Monthly Live Stream and Giveaway, where today we are joined by some of our good friends. We've got Gene with us and also a new face to the live streams somewhat, but yeah. uh, a familiar face if you're on our YouTube channel, Harrison. And so we'll go through uh, today. We're going to be talking about our uh, our HACO lineup or the HACO lineup in general, as well as, you know, since we've got a good, uh, you know, cast here, we want to also break this out into home theater and living room home theater more specifically. So if you guys have any questions, go ahead and start putting those in. So and just as a reminder, uh, these are mostly Q&A driven. So we do a uh, prize for the best question as well as our standard giveaway. But our best question prize today is a Heiko uh, subwoofer. So that's a, that's a good prize for a, for a best question. So keep those questions coming. And uh, and yeah, we hope to have you on there. So starting off, Gene, give us a uh, give us a brief, brief introduction. Tell us who you are, what you do. Hey, guys. I think uh, you probably know me by now. I've been on your channel before, but I'm with Audioholics. And uh, been, we're, we're celebrating 25 years in April. So we've been on for a long time. I'm old. You guys are young. You make me feel old when I'm on a live stream with you. And honestly, Harrison, I'm a little starstruck to be on a live stream with you because you're a rock star <laughs> on YouTube, man. Yeah, I don't I don't come on the live streams much, but yeah, I'm here today. Well, here's yeah, so tell, I, tell us your, oh no actually go, sorry gene go ahead finish up no, i love <laughs> i love these collaborations i didn't even know who heiko was until you guys brought them on like a year ago and introduced them to me so i really appreciate that because i think this brand deserves more attention they're doing some really good stuff for budget-minded people i don't know about their high-end stuff i haven't seen it but everything we've touched so far whether it was their aurora thousand towers or the 300 bookshelves very impressive engineering and and just good performance all around. Absolutely. Harrison? Yeah, well, you guys have probably seen my face before on a lot of the YouTube videos. I'm doing a lot of the reviews, shooting my, uh, you know, filming a lot of it, editing a lot of it. And uh, you can see I'm here in our studio today um, and decided to join you guys in the live stream because I've actually been living with the Heiko speakers for about two years now. Um, and as you probably know, I get to review and touch and see and listen to a ton of different speakers on our YouTube channel. Um, and I'm still using the Heikos. I really do like them that much. They're in my living room setup right now, the 1000s, and I have a couple subs and center channel. So I thought it'd be fun to hop on and chat with you and Gene about all things Heiko and home theater. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you guys for coming. And for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name's Nick. I'm one of the uh, theater designers here in our online side and, uh, you know, a fan of all things audio. So I've been a big fan of the Heiko speakers for a long time as well. So as soon as we got them, uh, just kind of give you guys some backstory on how we really found Heiko is we get, you know, speakers sent to our door all the time. And so we're kind of more picky about brands that we pick up because we want to make sure they're kind of up to our standards. And when these speakers came in, uh, our founder actually gave him a listen and was looking at, I think it was, I think it was the thousands of the towers. And uh, he was listening to them and said, you know, these, these punch above their weight. He's like, they're only, I can't remember what he said, uh, the price point. I think at, at that time they were eight fifty a, uh, uh, a piece. And he was like, they're only, uh, they're only eight fifty a piece. And so uh, the more we listened to him, the more we fell in love with them. And uh, yeah, we were able to get the price down a little bit more for right now. So yeah, they're they're awesome speakers. We're actually a huge fan of them. But um, awesome. And Harrison, go ahead and tell everybody what uh, we're giving away today as part of this. Yes. So for our giveaway, we are giving away a pair of the seven hundred towers, the Heiko seven hundred towers. Uh, we're also giving away a pair of the two hundred bookshelf speakers, and the subwoofer, and the center channel. So you're gonna have yourself a nice little home theater, media room, living room setup there. Um, you know, just add an AVR and. You're ready to ready to rock with a really nice setup. Awesome, awesome. Well, uh, to kind of kick this off, Gene, you've recently done some reviews on Heiko. Do you kind of want to just tell us a bit about what you found on on the Audioholics channel? Yeah, so we reviewed the Aurora One Thousand Towers, which I think is the flagship in that line, right? In the mm -hmm. Aurora line. Yeah. And we also did the Three Hundred Bookshelves, which are currently not available, unfortunately, but. Um, what we found was just consistent performance. You know, if, if you want to throw up some of the measurements that I'll, I'll share from my review, um, yeah. we could talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So we'll start off with the thousand right here. So tell everybody what they're looking at. Okay. So that's just, we, we just did a ground plane measurement to show you the base response of the speaker. And what you can see here is they have 
they're extended to about 50 hertz, usable base down to maybe in the 30s with room gain, you know, about 12 dB per octave roll off down to the tuning frequency, which is around 35 hertz, I think. I'm not looking at the impedance plot right now, so I can't tell you. But this is a decent amount of bass. Uh, they're not super deep. I would still recommend if you're setting up a, a uh, home theater to use at least one subwoofer to complement the uh, bass of these speakers. They have reasonably good efficiency. I think they were specced at 92, 93 dB. We measured 91 dB. Uh, that's still very good for a medium-sized tower like that. And uh, if you want to throw up the impedance plot, we could talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, let me see if I've got the impedance plot on here. I don't think I do. Well, if you don't, I do remember. So so the manufacturer basically says it's a, it's a four to eight ohm speaker. And I always hate the way it's not just Haco. A lot of manufacturers, they just want to dance around the whole towers being eight ohms when they're actually most of them are four ohms because you have a bunch of drivers in parallel. It's really hard to do an eight ohm speaker, and you don't necessarily want to do an eight ohm speaker when you've got that many drivers in parallel. So the Haco is legitimately a four ohm speaker, but it doesn't have any sharp phase angles. It's got pretty high sensitivity. I think most mid price AVRs would drive it fine. And I think Harrison, you guys were doing demos at AudioVice Live last year, and you did it with a Sony ES. And I, I do really like those receivers because mm -hmm. those receivers have a nice meaty power supplies, yep. and they could drive those forum speakers really well. And that's what everybody heard. I, I remember um, just hearing from people at AudioVice Live being very impressed with that demo room. Yeah, I yeah. think it was the three thousand, the Sony three thousand. And mm -hmm. honestly, I think uh, our team set it up. I went up there and listened to it, and they had a setup better than the one the setup at my home and i was like man i gotta go home and <laughs> fix all this there, there's a great photo of it yeah you can see the two subs up front in the center channel i think those are thousands up front mm -hmm. i think we had 300s on the sides and i think we actually mm -hmm. had towers in the back as well but it was a really nice little demo room they sounded really great for their price and you know obviously being in a hotel room but i was really impressed with that setup yeah. Uh, Nick, yeah, do you have a couple of more measurements that we could talk about before we move on? Because I think yeah, we have absolutely. Vertical, and vertical and horizontal just to yep. give people a little. So, so that's the vertical response. And the nice thing about this graph is look how consistent it is from zero degrees mm -hmm. up to plus or minus 15 degrees. And what that tells you is you don't have to be your ears don't have to be right at the height of the tweeter. Right. I mean, you you have some leeway here. So even if you have a second row and the second row is a little bit above the tweeter axis, you're still getting very good coverage of the speaker. I mean, that's that's an impressive set of measurements right there. It just shows you they're consistent whether you're sitting or you're just a little bit above or below the tweeter axis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's something we get questions on a lot. You know, whenever people are building risers, they're like, is, is the tweeter gonna, or is, really is the speaker gonna perform differently if I'm sitting in my second row versus my first row? And Technically, the technical answer is yes, it's always going to, you know, some frequencies are going to be different depending on where you are in the room, but the speaker performance itself is going to be fairly identical. Um, and let's show off this one. So the horizontal is really the important uh, set of measurements here. And when you look at this, and this is like a 3D model of the horizontal all the way on, on and off axis up to plus or minus 90 degrees. And by the way, I just want to shout out to James Larson because he takes the speakers outdoors and puts them up on a platform. <laughs> and he he's a hard worker, man. So I really appreciate that he's doing this for us. But this is a beautiful graph. What you're seeing here is a very consistent response with a nice uh, uniform response on and off axis. And what this tells you is the speaker is amenable to EQ if you want to. It'll be consistent mm -hmm. if you EQ it. You can see there's a little bit of a bump uh, above 10 kilohertz in the treble region. Mm -hmm. Personally, I don't find that objectionable if, as long as the speaker behaves like this one is doing. Sometimes people like that a little extra sparkle. But the nice thing mm -hmm. about this is because the speaker is so consistent on and off axis, if you think the speaker tends to be a little too trebly in your room, you could turn it down and you can get consistent results doing that. So you have that option there. Yeah. Well, no, exactly what you said. It's it's a, it's a little bit more EQable. And then on top of that, a lot of your detail and especially people who struggle with not necessarily vocal range up at that uh, that area, but a lot more of your textures and your finer details are going to be in that upper register. And well, look so really closely look, when you look really closely at that graph at the mid range. Mm -hmm. Look how even that is, man. Yeah, there's uh, what are these? What are these sixteen hundred bucks a pair? I forgot. Uh, I think they're what eleven hundred a pair. Yeah, about eleven. Yeah. Okay. yeah. 
cheaper than so, that. So I think the retail was sixteen hundred. Yeah, the guys, retail sixteen. We've got them currently at eleven. I mean, it's hard to find a speaker, uh, a tower speaker at that price that measures that behaves so well. You mm -hmm. know, when I saw that tweeter at first with the little kind of circles, I'm like, I didn't know what that was. I thought that was a coaxial driver on, from the pitcher. Yeah. But it's some weird German wave guide that they put on the tweeter, and it's yeah. it's working. I mean, like, my hat's off to them. They, <laughs> I think they, they call it engineering the fluctus tweeter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the fluctus. fluctus. But no, I do. And it, it does work. I mean, the off-axis performance is, is, is very good for those. Um, you know, we've put those in quite a few rooms so far, as, as people can probably see. We're, we're out of some models right now. We're waiting to get more accurate ETAs before we pre-order on our site. But, uh, but we've sold through an absolute ton of these uh, speakers. And people are starting to, you know, again, there's not much marketing. Gene, you hadn't heard of them in America. And since we started picking up just kind of word of mouth, these speakers have really grown. So we we love them so far. But uh, now the off-axis is absolutely fantastic. And just for the price point, they you know, punch above their weight class for sure. What's really neat, too, is you guys, I think you're the sole supplier for the brand in the United States. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, purchasing from you guys and getting the support that you guys offer is is just an asset, you know, because you're buying a speaker that's this affordable and then you get your phone support and everything else to, to get the mm -hmm. setup right with, with your customers. I mean, it's a really, it's a compelling product. Well, we appreciate that. Yeah. That's, that's one thing we try to pride ourselves into, you know, if somebody buys a speaker from us, cause I mean, at the end of the day, $1,100, I know in our hobby, we become jaded, but $1,100 is not a small purchase, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and if, if somebody calls in and has questions about, uh, you know, placement inside of the room or anything like that, we're happy to give tips and, you know, set up and they, they go to the back of the speaker. And if they're not familiar, you know, if this is their first you have step into to hi-fi you know they see two sets of binding posts like why do we see two sets of binding posts mm -hmm. what's uh what do i do with these or they've got a jumper on there should i take this jumper off and you know so questions like that we try to you know answer as we go along but um you know but so also, i have a question for you guys if you don't mind harrison yeah. or nick since you set up these haco systems i'm assuming you would a typical system would be the aurora 1000s up front the center channel maybe a couple of subs, maybe not even the Heiko subs, maybe some SVS SB 3000s, which I think would pair real nicely with this system. Mm -hmm. Do you use the on wall for the sides and back channels and it, or do you use the bookshelf? And then what do you use for height channels that we think are a good tonal match for, mm -hmm. for doing Atmos since they don't make it flush mount product, do they? Right. No. Yep. yep. Harrison, why don't you get first? Well, yeah, I, uh, you know, in my previous, um, place that I was living, I actually did use the thousands up front center channel and I had two subs up front as well. Um, and since I was renting, I couldn't, you know, cut holes or Atmos or anything like that um, in the rears and my couch was against a wall. So I did use some of their ambient. They do have uh, on walls, which are really nice. It's literally one screw or maybe two screws and you mount it to the wall. So you don't have to worry about, you know, if you live in an apartment or so on, you don't have to worry about cutting holes and everything. Um, and I really did enjoy those ambience. And we've actually installed a couple theaters with the ambience on the sides is left and right and underneath the TV. Um, and so the ambience are a great option using those on the wall. Um, they also obviously have the 300 bookshelves and the 200 bookshelves that work great as sides and rears, but those ambience are a really nice touch and they do pair really well um, with the rest of the lineup and you can mix and match them. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, and you know, for, for architectural or you know, flush mount type speakers, they, they don't make, you know, they don't make one. So you have to kind of go with a similar match and kind of my rule of thumb for those. I mean, obviously we'd love to see that, but I don't think we're going to see it anytime soon. Um, you know, typically I go with something like a, like a Revel or a Bowers and Wilkins, something like that. That's going to have a somewhat similar sound signature, similar tweeter design, depending on the line, but for the most mm -hmm. part of similar tweeter design, um, and that's what we generally use for heights. Uh, but I love that they offer an on wall speaker. Yeah, you know, we generally try to go with something like the the 200s or 300s for the side surrounds. But uh, one thing to really keep in mind is that if we can move, so let's say that we have narrow, you know, narrow walkways, and our chair is two feet from, yeah, you know, we have a two week two foot walkway from us to the wall. We want to try to create some space there so people either a have you know, room to get through where the speaker has time to fully disperse before it gets to the to the listening area and that's whenever i generally use a um an on wall speaker yeah uh, so some of their ambient lines and you know just because otherwise you can really localize the speaker if it's too close yeah. to your i don't like it like a floor standing speaker as a surround if you're within a few feet it becomes very localized because that mm -hmm. tweeter is right at ear height 
Um, yeah. you, you know, the other thing I wasn't sure about, um, I forgive my ignorance because I haven't looked at the speaker in a while. Does it have any kind of mounting uh, hole or anything? If you want to put brackets to, to mount the, the bookshelf, like it, what's mm -hmm. the best way to mount that? Do you guys offer a mount if someone wants to put it on a wall? No, th they don't offer one for the wall. There, there are a lot of third party, um, there are a lot of third party companies that make bookshelf mounts, but you, you have to do the scariest thing in the world, which is drilling into a speaker. Um, mm -hmm. That's absolutely nerve wracking. But uh, <laughs> otherwise, you know, you can do some type of shelf on your wall. Um, but I think a lot of people and Gene, maybe you can touch on this as well. What your thoughts on it? A lot of people are afraid to put bookshelves that are rear ported on a wall. Um, what are your kind of thoughts on that? You know, do you always say, Hey, that's an absolute no, or is, is are there, there use cases where that works? It, it becomes less of a problem when you base manage a speaker, right? Mm -hmm. So you could plug the port if they, if they offer plugs for the port, so you could put a sock in the port. But what I've found is when you take a port, a rear ported speaker and you base manage it, it pretty much does the same thing as sealing the port. Cause you're crossing it over at 80 Hertz and the mm -hmm. port's really not contributing much at that point. So that's mm -hmm. kind of my take on that. But I do prefer, like you said, Nick, I prefer an on-wall equivalent, even though there's less bass output. It gets that speaker further away from the listening area, and then people aren't going to bump into it. I've seen systems where people have put bookshelf speakers at ear level height, and then you're walking down the hallway and you, your shoulder hits the speaker. You, know, you don't want that. Yep. Yeah, well... I'm, I'm guilty as charged on that one uh, for uh, for my room. I mean, the, the line that I go with in, in my theater doesn't have an on-wall speaker. So uh, I had to do a bookshelf before I went to an in-wall. And uh, one thing is whenever I cut the room out pitch black, people walk by, there's a good chance they're going to they're, <laughs> they're gonna hit it on the way out. But yeah. again, you know, it's not, it's not always best to use an on-wall. But generally speaking, the uh, bookshelves are going to have uh, – you know, a better frequency response overall. They can go down much deeper. Um, not that that really matters whenever you're using a subwoofer, but yeah, you know, overall they are probably a little bit more clarity. Um, so, in my opinion, and I don't want to try to sell upsell people on more subs, but if I was buying the Aurora One Thousands in a home theater environment, I would still base manage that speaker because there's a lot of output in the fifty to eighty hertz range that that speaker is capable of doing, and you get some two good potent subs like the SVS SB 3000s, for example, or one of the REL mm -hmm. ones that you guys like, you're going to get a full range sound. You're going to, you're going to have more dynamic range out of the speaker. You're going to have more dynamics available from the receiver. So if you choose an, a Sony 3000 receiver and it's not taxing it to do the bass for the main speakers and you're crossing it over at 80 Hertz, you're just going to open up more dynamic range and you're going to allow the subwoofers to do the bass heavy lifting and you're going to get more consistent bass in your listening area by having two subs properly placed mm -hmm. and set up. Well, while we're on the topic, we've got some good questions. We're going to go ahead and jump in some of the, uh, the audience questions. So let's take a look here. Question. Would we set the Heiko towers to large in our system, even if we have a capable subwoofer? So the problem with setting, and I do this in, in all my systems, I have towers that are base capable and I set them large, but 90% of the time people will screw up the integration between the towers and the subs when they do that. And I caution, unless you're proficient in measuring an REW and you're proficient at setting up room correction, I would almost always tell people to base manage their speakers because the speaker is, it's not like the speaker is not going to produce bass when you base manage it. You're still getting that mid bass out of that speaker. There's an advantage to the tower over the bookshelf just for mid brace output and sensitivity, that's gonna blend even better with those subwoofers. So in this case, it's a home theater, you've got a capable subwoofer, you're doing multi-channel, I would still base manage that speaker unless you're really good at integrating full range towers with subwoofers. Mm -hmm. Harrison, in your living room, do you have, do you have your speakers crossed or you set them up as large? Uh, you know, I have switched back and forth a few times at my old place that I was in. Uh, I believe my, I had them large at first, and now I've switched them and I had them crossed over. Um, but I've exper I've experimented with a little bit of both, and you know, I it, it, my room is so not ideal. It's open open living mm -hmm. space to a dining room and a and a kitchen that uh, it's not it's not the best testing area. <laughs> so I sort of tune it to what I like and then go from there. Gotcha. So let's see, let's take a look at some other questions. So we have here, will most AVRs power a four ohm speaker? Really common questions that we get. Uh, so, thoughts, Gene? So 
the really cheap AVRs, like the five, and I hate to say cheap because five hundred dollars is still an investment, but mm -hmm. those tend to have a lot of nannies. Like if you look at, and I'm not trying to put Yamaha on the spot, but when you bench test the Yamaha, like the lower end receivers, and you start driving forearm loads, the they start current limiting really quickly. Sometimes 50, 60 watts is all you get out of them. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to drive a forearm speaker, um, you should have a decently sized mid-priced AVR, something that's got a good power supply in it. Like I said, the thousand dollar and up receiver should be okay doing it. And again, I would still most of the time base manage the speakers anyway and let the heavy lifting be done by the subwoofers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm kind of the same thinking too. You know, a lot of people look at some of the entry level, you know, entry level receivers and they see a power rating and they look at something that's three times its price and see the same power, quote unquote, mm -hmm. that's listed in the specs. And they're like, well, both of these are 100 watts. And it's not always an accurate measurement there. <laughs> <laughs> or, no, and I'll, give you, or, I'll give you a perfect example. I have a Denon A110. I don't know if you guys have ever looked at the integrated amp for Denon. Mm -hmm. It's a masterpiece. The thing is 80 watts a channel. That's its rating, right? And if you compare that to a 150 watt Denon receiver, they sound totally different. The 80 mm -hmm. watt Denon integrated doubles down with every time you lower the impedance because it has the current capability. And mm -hmm. when you get an amplifier that can really drive low impedance really well for a tower speaker, that amplifier sounds a lot bigger because it's per, it's providing that current. It's not compressing or current limiting when it's hitting those low impedance peaks and it's hitting you know large music in those ranges. So yes, we, th this could be a whole separate live stream, but specs, amplifier power is not created equal. You got to look at the fine print and how it's rated. And most of the AVRs, they'll rate it at like one channel driven at 10% distortion at six ohms on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you yeah. gotta cut that rating in half <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> on pure overdrive mode well that yeah. was like uh you know the a lot of people talk about uh older receivers they're like well the older receivers had so much more power you know my yamaha cr2020 weighed 80 pounds and you know, right. was boasting you know 80 watts uh but it's a lot more high output than you know some of your super you know 200 dollars entry level uh receivers that claim the same amount but yep Let's take a look at some uh, some more questions. Um, da, 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 da. Okay, so if you use Odyssey or something similar, uh, would that take care of the base management of the towers? So Odyssey, um, I if you have Odyssey PC with the uh, with the PC app, you could do a lot more with that program than just the run that you plug into the microphone into the receiver and and run it off the receiver. I found not just with Odyssey, but a lot of room correction systems, they'll kind of botch up the base management. You got to go in and tweak it. Sometimes if a speaker's close to a wall, like a bookshelf speaker, it'll it'll set that as large because it's getting that boundary reinforcement, right? Mm -hmm. So again, I would recommend after you run Odyssey is to go into the base management settings, set all your speakers to small in 95% of the cases and do some listening because sometimes the subwoofer delays they don't get the subwoofer delays quite right if there's dsp in the sub there tends to be um you have to add more distance to compensate i've seen hit or miss with odyssey getting the getting the delays right you guys have done tons of dirac uh mm -hmm. calibration so you could speak on that do you have to go in sometimes and change the subwoofer delays to get the dirac to work to get the blend with the subwoofers and the and the lcrs you know, recently we haven't really had, we, we actually just put out a new uh, video on running Dirac, um, which we'll put in the comments so you guys can take a look at it. But generally we we don't have that issue anymore. It's it's very accurate. Same thing goes for uh, Anthem Room Correction Arc. Um, for the most part, we don't have to do too much touching up to that it's until afterwards, after we've done everything, we go through and do some adjustments to the curves because again, you know, that's just where kind taste. of- yeah, kind of base the taste, uh, sprinkle as needed. Uh, so yeah, generally speaking, the, the timing seems to be very accurate on those, especially uh, on Anthem Room Correction. Their phase alignment has gotten mm -hmm. really good in the past couple of years. Um, so I know that you know Anthem might be a little bit expensive to pair with some of the Heikos, but the five the 540 would, I think, probably be reasonable if you're doing a 5.1 um, with this system and yeah, it would integrate very well with the base. Um, which Gene, you've played with art quite a bit. Um, do you like yeah, the, the phase correction? 
I really do like it. I set it up in a bedroom system and I've used a passive Klipsch heritage soundbar, which I don't know if mm -hmm. you guys are familiar with. It's like, mm -hmm. it plays only down to about 120, 150 Hertz and Arc Genesis nailed it. it. It nailed the crossover points, right? It did the phase alignment to my, I have two JL audio in ceiling subs. And all I had to do was go into the Arc Genesis and just raise the room gain. Cause I wanted a little bit more bass than what it said. I think I added three or four DB. And I didn't mess with it after that. I was like, wow, that was mm -hmm. like, that's one of the quickest. And I'm not trying to like push people towards Anthem, but they really are maybe the quickest receivers to set up to get sounding good out of the box. Mm -hmm. And I love all the other brands too. Some of them take a little bit more massage in them. Yeah. Well, that's kind of the the balancing act between making a really cool you know, DSP inside of a uh, inside of an AVR because you want to make it where it's robust enough that you can change whatever you really need to. So if, mm -hmm. if I want to go in and say, hey, in my 5K, you know, if you got a really good ear, you want to say, hey, right around 5K, it seems a little bit, you know, a little bit too high or a little bit too low. I can go in and change that exact range. Um, but also you don't want to confuse the average person who's setting it up. Uh, you know, just somebody who says, hey, this is my first dive into a higher end AVR and I have no clue what I'm doing. And ultimately, whenever you run DSP, you don't want it to do more harm than good. <laughs> yeah. you know? So that's that's the uh, the balancing act. I think that Anthem definitely does do a good job of that. Um, you know, here we're very, you know, we kind of work with every single DSP um, or room correction rather. Um, you know, typically Dirac and Arc are the ones that I work with a lot. Um, but I'm not going to lie, I've got two receivers in my theater. <laughs> so I, I kind of play back and forth and see which ones I like the most. But uh, kind of as you said, Gene, right out of the box, Arc probably does uh, one of the best jobs in terms of, you know, without any tweaking. But, you know, if you guys buy from us, that's why we're here. We can help you tweak Dirac as well. Yes. Yeah. How does that work? How does that work exactly? Does So if someone, if someone buys a receiver from you, because I, I just want to understand this better. Someone mm -hmm. buys, let's say a mid-price Marantz, which has, and they buy the license for Dirac or Dirac. Mm -hmm. I say Dirac, you say Dirac. Um, <laughs> Do you guys actually go in and look at their file afterwards and just give them suggestions on how to fix or improve it? How does that work? So, well, a few things we've got uh, for people who purchase from us, we actually have our own house curves now that we're working on that we can send out and say, because there's a section that says upload house curve. Once you upload that, it'll just shape the curve to your system. Um, mm -hmm. which is really great because a lot of people, that's all they need. Now, if they need additional help, you know, specifically I work on a lot of theaters that are kind of ground up. So we work on everything from the design to the equipment list, et cetera. So for those people, you know, I'll actually remote into their system and you know, help them out with the measurements, say, Hey, we want to put the microphone here, 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 and here, walk through that entire thing and do the curve for them. But if you purchase from us and you have issues, just contact us and we can find a way to help you either with the measurements or, you know, with the, uh, with the curve at the end. But Nick, uh, Harrison, like, you were going to say something before. Yeah. Well, like you said, we do have the full Dirac, you know, we had an older one, but we've just released an updated one. So you can follow along with that and it will get you, you know, 99% of the way there. But of course, everyone's got different rooms. Something might pop up, something might not work. Um, but you can always call or chat with our, our team and they can help you out remote in like Nick said. And same with the Arc Genesis. We also have a full setup video for that too. So again, you can follow along and it's pretty self-explanatory with how they have it set up now. It's really, really user-friendly. But you know, if you just put your laptop or iPad next to it and follow step by step, you can literally get it set up and running by yourself, even if it's your very first time by following one of those guides. And then, mm -hmm. like I said, you always got us as a backup to give a call in case you get stuck. Yeah. Well, that's... Yeah, I think the measurement side or the, the setting the level side was the part that confuses people because Anthem, the Arc Genesis, you get past all that. It does all of that for you. Mm -hmm. um, and then Dirac, you kind of do it manually, which is great because you can kind of set it to your preferred listening vo volume. Not everybody listens at, you know, 85 dB with, mm -hmm. you know, 110 dB yeah, <laughs> spikes yeah. through there. Uh, oh, it can, <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm going to tell you yeah. about it. That's uh, bordering the line. And I think, the, I think the physical... <laughs> act of moving the microphone too is what I see a lot of questions on as well. And oh, yeah. in both of those videos, we kind of address, um, you know, where to place the microphones. I know Dirac has like that guide of it shows it here and here and there. And um, if you watch our setup video, you can see that like, it's not as intimidating as it seems, you know, you're really measuring around that main listening position and you don't have to get crazy and, you know, have it exactly here, exactly there. Um, 
but again, we walk all through every step, not just the on-screen guide, but, mm -hmm. you know, turning off your HVAC systems and making sure there's no rattles and, you know, all the minor things that are going to potentially have cause a problem um, with one of those systems setting it up. Mm -hmm. So one thing I think is important to mention, and people may not realize this, if you, I've seen a lot of setups where they have the couch up against the back wall, right? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that's not the great, that's not the greatest place for sound because you're in a maximum pressure area. You're also, you know, maybe close to a back channel and you're really far from the front speakers. But if you can't avoid that and you have that couch at the back wall, don't put the microphone near that back wall. If you put the microphone any closer than a meter, you're going to get erroneous results. I've been talking with uh, Matthew Pose and actually the direct people. And they're like, even if your chair is up against that wall, put that microphone forward because you're just in yeah. a region where you're going to get some bad results. And if you're trying to calibrate there, it's just going to hose the system. So I think that goes, yeah, yeah, that goes well too with, um, you know, a lot of people, if they have a theater chair that's right up next to a surround or side, you know, you don't really want that mic right up against that that speaker. Yep. So it's okay to move it a little bit more towards the main listening position. And um, you don't want it right next to a speaker or right next to that back wall. And like you said, that if you have the option to move your couch up, great. But if you don't, then that's a great tip. Um, move it up so you're not getting all crazy. Yeah, like which I've actually I've had both of these scenarios in the past. You yeah. know, my, my old house, I had a uh, seating position up against the back wall. And I had my surrounds directly to my left and right. And I, I tried it a bunch of different ways to see if I could get direct to work properly with the setup. And the only times I could was exactly what Gene said, get it about three feet off the wall, um, which your distances at that point are not exactly lined up with my back seating position, but at least my frequencies are a little bit more smoothed out because otherwise what it does is it strips out almost all your base uh, yeah. because it's, it's expecting you to have just this big boost of base in your back row. Yep. And, um, and we we met with the direct people, uh, you know, direct people not long ago, and they said the exact same thing. <laughs> like, you know, if you're up against the wall, don't take a measurement right up against the wall, or else it's just going to be full of base. And um, you know, riffing off of what Harrison said too, with having surround speakers. So one of the cool things that uh, most of these room correction softwares do is they actually uh, can can weight measurements. So mm -hmm. depending on you know where the measurement is is what's most important. Now. With most today, the center the center seat is your most important spot, and then everything else is weighted equally. So if you have a seat that's right next to a speaker, it's going to want to turn down that surround speaker probably too much. And if you only sit in that, you know, ten percent of the time, maybe don't measure it. <laughs> that's yeah. yeah, do a more focused measurement. And then the other guideline too is if you have a multi row theater, and let's say you have eight seats you're not going to necessarily get every seat to sound good. So yeah. ignore the bad seats. That's really, mm -hmm. don't put the microphone in a really like in a corner of a room because you want to get that seat good. Cause it's just going to bias the measurements and you're going to get less of a good result. So it's really better to focus on the, the two or three really good primary seats that you care about. Cause you, you're going to fix those responses. You're probably not going to damage the other ones, but if you try to fix all of them, you're going to damage all the yeah. whole calibration is not going to be good, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you're much better off focusing on that main listening position and kind of going from there. So let's see. We've got a few questions. Harrison, do you see any that uh, that are standing out to you? All right, so I actually got some Find more one. that are. Uh, what exactly is room correction modifying tone distance EQ all of the above? I know we're kind of derailing this and going from just speakers, <laughs> but I think that it, you know, it's, it's important to kind of look at theater as a whole because there's really not, you can focus on speakers and you can talk about any part of speakers all day, but, uh, you know, all this together is kind of forming what it's, uh, what it's all about. But, uh, what is exactly is room correction modifying tone distance EQ all of the above? Depends on what you let it do, right? I mean, you could do you could do the auto setup and could just do the delays and levels and you could disable the EQ and it won't change your tone, but it could do all of the above. And some people don't often realize, but you're moving your couch is also EQ. That's called positional mm -hmm. EQ. So if you're in a bad seat and you want to move that couch forward and get more towards the middle of the room, that's going to have a significant impact on what you hear in terms of imaging, ba especially bass. So don't just rely on the EQ system, 
but make sure you get good seating position and get good speaker placement and get good room acoustics. I, I you know, I was just at Florida Audio Expo uh, last week. It's a two channel show. And most of the setups, they had no passive treatments at all in the rooms, but they had $50,000 speaker cables on elevators. And they're trying to tune a, <laughs> they're trying to tune a system with, EQ, with they're trying to tune a system with a piece of wire instead of actually improving the room or even improving where the seat locations are. And I just, I know it's, I sound like a broken record saying this, but you got to keep repeating it to people so they understand the importance of proper calibration, proper placement of your seats and your speakers and proper room acoustics. The chain's only as good as the weakest link, man. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's, that's something that I, Room acoustics do sacrifice aesthetic uh, in some cases. Uh, you know, if you look at some of the Vicoustic uh, panels, they look very yeah. good. The Kinetics panels look very good. Um, but some people are like, I don't want to mess up my you know, my room. You can do room correction to kind of overcome some of that. But really, there's not much of a replacement for, or excuse me, passive treatment as well as proper positioning inside of a room. Do you guys this, offer fabric strep, stretched... Uh services like if you want someone to come mm -hmm. in do you offer yeah. that yep yep so we do the the stretch systems for remote jobs uh yeah we would have to send somebody out there to do it we don't just sell the the parts to it but we're actually um about to show off which harrison can i talk about the uh the new room in the showroom yeah, yeah. all right cool uh so we've got a uh well actually you know what harrison you tell them about it you, you spent more time in there than me yeah you're talking about the new test area well, that and, and the theater. Yeah. Well, yep. both of those. we're doing a lot of updates here, uh, especially at our Raleigh showroom and our Charlotte showroom right now. But um, we're working on upgrading and updating one of our theaters, our biggest theater here at the Raleigh showroom right now. Um, and we just installed full kinetics with that stretched um, fabric Ooh. we were just mentioning. Mm -hmm. um, a full Starfield ceiling, a lot. We're going to have a lot more to come and once it's fully finished and everything. But it's really, really cool. Um, so it's got all the different acoustic treatments. I think we're going to have all JBL synthesis in there. Um, mm -hmm. It'll be uh, room correction will be Dirac, obviously. And no, actually, I think in theater three, I think we're doing, are we not doing Trinov in there? You might be right. I, I, think, I, I think they're doing Trinov in there in the lab. We're doing uh, yep. Dirac. We're so then, so yes, yeah, so we've also recently added another testing lab. Um, so we, we test in multiple different areas, um, different theaters, uh, all over the blue. We take products home and test them in our home environments. But just recently we built out a little uh, proper testing lab area, which is um, just another spot that we can test, you know, Dirac versus Odyssey versus um, Arc Genesis and basically hot swap receivers and everything. So we're really excited to test out speaker placement and room correction, everything, um, you know, and really show off what it can do and what it can't do in certain type of environments and have a completely modular location <laughs> to change mm -hmm. and test everything out in. So people yeah. that aren't out familiar with kinetics, they're the trend of room acoustics. They're that good. I mean, that's, it, they're mm -hmm. not cheap, but uh, they make some incredible product. Yeah. And yeah. we'll have a full video and tour when this theater is done here. So we'll walk you, you know, we're going to show the, the kinetics on the walls before that they're stretched out um, the fabric stretched on them and everything. And we have a full, basically time lapse of the whole thing. So it's really cool to see this theater get retrofitted. It's going to be really awesome. Mm -hmm. So can and, I ask a request of you guys yeah. since since there is the room bare right now, it doesn't have room treatments in it. It no, does oh, currently. Yeah. They're Darn. they're working through the process now. I was yeah, going to tell you how to do I was going to tell you how to do a couple of measurements like RT60 decay time so you could do before and after cuz that would I be know. really <laughs> really cool video topic to oh no dude you wanted me to do that in my my theater i added kinetics uh panels to my theater gene was like do it before and after but once i got the panels in i got too excited i was like i can't i, I well, couldn't yeah, wait to go ahead. plenty of like i mean we'll be ripping out more stuff and replacing more yeah. stuff next one we yeah. rip out i'm sure it'll be soon and we should definitely do that yeah, we, yeah, we're gonna have some sure. cool content coming along for the um uh for the 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 test lab as well so basically we wanted a place for you know a lot of our you know, a lot of our employees to be able to go in and just hear the difference between two different pieces. Because once you get into the upper range of gear, you're like, okay, what is a $5,000 piece versus a 7,000 versus a 10,000? And it kind of gives a place for us to, to test all that out. But enough of our harping. I'm, I'm my attention, uh, <laughs> my attention broke a little bit there, but we had another question. We were talking about EQ before. 
And Gene, you were talking about seating position and somebody, uh, Eric, uh, asked, why does pulling a speaker out from a wall change the sound? So typically that's room gain. But Gene, kind of explain how that, that works a little bit. So I have a debate going with Matthew Pose on this, actually, because he, he thinks you can get equivalent sound with a flush mount product in terms of imaging and soundstage and versus putting a speaker out in a room. I tend to disagree with that. All my experiences is when you put a speaker out in the room, you get you have the potential of getting better imaging because you get that depth of the sound because the speaker doesn't just radiate forward when it's out in the room, right? If it's if it's in a wall, it only radiates forward. The wave front of the sound just comes out of the wall and it comes out at you. The advantage of that is you don't have speaker boundary interference issues, so you don't get bass cancellations like that I'm dealing with in my theater room. But putting the speaker out into the room actually gives you that the sound around the speaker is hitting that front wall and it's coming back at a, at a delayed sound. And it, to my, in my opinion, it gives you an expanded soundstage. You hear more depth in the soundstage. And sometimes you can you have compromises in the bass, but other times it can actually you can actually prefer it, especially if you're putting some subwoofers behind the speakers. I really like having speakers out in the room and then having the subs against the front wall because that takes care of the speaker boundary interference issue, and then you get great imaging properties. But some people don't like having speakers out in the middle of the room. But um, you definitely, that's my biggest advantage that I see is when you put a speaker out in the room, it gives it, I hate to say the word breathing, but it's actually allowing the speaker to breathe and radiate its sound, not just from the front baffle, but from all around the speaker itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there's definitely a, a balancing act there. I know Samiko in specific for a long time had the Samiko master placement, which is like the most laborsome speaker placement, I think in the, the world and will make you hate certain songs. Uh, but their whole thing was just a balancing act of you start with one speaker, pull it out. And there's a point in the room where, you know, bass is the best couple to the to room itself. Imaging that it's kind of maximum. And, you know, again, some people have had luck with it. Some people haven't. Um, but generally speaking, it's not convenient for a lot of like multi-use spaces to have speakers far off the wall. Um, yeah. So I, you know, I say, yes, you should do it, but you go into like forums and somebody posts their living room. That's you know a beautiful living room with nice speakers. And, and the first comments, like your speakers are too close to the wall. <laughs> like, well, well, you, yeah, do, you get so more boundary, you, you, you get more boundary gain. So you'll, yeah. you'll get, if you put it too close to the wall and it's not in the wall, you're going to get a bump in the base, but you're also going to get a dip from the speaker boundary interference. And that, changes depending on how far off the wall you have it. So when you push them mm -hmm. out further, it raises it up and then the subwoofers can take care of of, of filling in the gap or I'm sorry, mm -hmm. lowers it so it fills in the gap. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a, it's a little bit more. Yeah, I think speakers are more susceptible to it, too, if they're rear ported. You know, so if we look at like the, the Heiko 1000s, for example, if you start pushing those more towards a wall and you're running them as full range towers. So let's say that we're running two channel, for example, mm -hmm. pushing them through towards a wall is going to give them more base. Um, yeah. And they're going to be a little bit more susceptible to that than comparing it to something like a, um, yeah, a speaker that's front ported. Now so, I will tell you this. I don't know if I could talk about another speaker brand on here, but I got to hear the new SVS uh, ultra. Evos. Yeah, do it, man. <laughs> Those things are freaking amazing, man. I've never like been blown away by an SVS tower in the past. Like I thought some of their stuff, like the Prime Pinnacle, were good. Um, the Ultras weren't my favorite tower in that price range. But what I heard at the Florida Audio Expo with the with their new flagship, and I'm, we're doing a video on it. It should drop like next week or something. But mm -hmm. so they have woofers in the front and the back, and the way those speakers wow. loaded into the room. Uh, it was just magical. Like it, I, I, I had to get up at one point just to make sure I wasn't being conned because they had a couple of subwoofers in the room and I put my hand on all their subwoofers when they were playing some tracks and all of them were turned off. And wow, that's awesome. Five grand a pair. They look, they have the aesthetic of a focal and yeah. they, Im they image great, man. They, I like that they're using an MTM now. So you get increased mm -hmm. dynamic range in the mid range and you get some control of the, of the vertical dispersion. And they just look beautiful. I mean, you walk in and you look at this and you're like, wow, that's an SVS speaker. So I'm sure you guys are going to be getting samples and you'll be doing videos on them. Yeah, uh, I think we have we have a couple coming on the way very shortly here. We're going to have a full review soon. And um, yeah, hopefully we can get some pre-order links up and they're not too far along here. But from what we've heard, they're very impressive and pretty excited to get our hands on them. 
Harrison, they're a little bit more be, expensive price point too. Yeah, you, <laughs> but you're going to be blown, you, you're going to be blown away by the base on them, man. I mean, yeah, every, honestly, everything the, is good. Everything is good. They're yeah. not boomy. I'm not saying that they're. I'm not saying that buy a speaker just because of the bass response, but right. this speaker has really impressive bass response. Yeah, and mm -hmm. they look they look really beautiful too. You know, they look like a high high end speaker. You know, so mm -hmm. it's it seems like it's got everything it needs, and I'm pretty excited to put them to the test. You know what yeah. I would love if you guys could do at some point since you have all these sound labs? Yeah. Put those speakers in the same room as the new Focal Evo X. Oh, those, yeah. are six, those are six grand a pair, and those speakers, are, they're beautiful, and they sound great. I would be curious to see the tonal differences that you guys observe. Because, they're, look, they're both good speakers. I'm not going to say one's good, one's bad. It really yeah. depends on preference and trade-offs. Everything is about mm -hmm. trade-offs, right? But I would love to compare those two speakers to – you know, just to see what the pros and cons of each are. For yeah. Sure. Yeah. I yeah. know we get, there we go, getting sidetracked again on a, <laughs> on a different speaker, like but no, I agree. Uh, and Harrison's the lucky one. Harrison gets like his hands on everything very first. And yeah. so I'm it's, like, it's, hey, it's a blessing and a curse it? because sometimes I get it and I have such short time with it. Right. So it's like, yeah. I get to listen to it. I test it, review it, you know, and we're, you mm -hmm. know, a lot of other people from audio advice that come back and they, we all listen to it and we all test them, but it's either got to be shipped off to the next area or, you know, it's like, oh, I want to take this home and keep listening to it. <laughs> so it's, mm -hmm. it's awesome to be able to experience everything. And I'm like, Hey, can you guys send it over to me when you're done with it? <laughs> so I can play with it. I don't want to have to drive into the showroom, but <laughs> let's see. All right. Let's, let's jump to some more questions. Um, I have dual subs. I can only place in certain locations. They are not where they probably should be. How does room connect correction work in this scenario? So let's let's kind of jump into our uh, the question that we always have to ask on here. Uh, first of all, where are ideal locations for subwoofers? Uh, and then second of all, you know, is how much can room correction kind of overcome for that? So, Gene, do you want to kind of start this one off? The hard question, the hard way to, it's hard to answer that question because most people don't have a perfectly rectangular room, right? With walls that are uh, infinitely rigid. Mm -hmm. So if you had such rooms, if you look at the simulations that the guys at Harman did, like Todd Welty, who's a genius, by the way, um, four corners, one in each corner is really the best way to get good seat to seat consistency and get um, good gain from all the subs, right? You get the most efficiency. The mid walls are even better for seat to seat consistency, but you don't get as much of a low frequency coupling factor. So you need to use bigger subs. So personally, I like to use the corners when possible, but I recognize even in my own theater, cause I have a, I have a closet in the back left corner for the equipment rack. And that really screwed up my subwoofer placements. And I'm challenged. I have five subwoofers in my system and my target is to get plus and minus five DB base across all seven seats, two rows. And I'm still struggling. So the only way that's going to do that is either if I use approach like MSO or I use direct art, which I'm also uh, still testing and trying to get that integrated. So a rule of thumb is start with a corner. You know, if you have two subs, start with the front walls, one in each corner or at least behind the main speakers is a good point. Sometimes diagonal placement, one on each one in the front left corner, one in the back right corner can work. The, the important thing is it's it's an advantage to have a receiver that has multiple sub outs with independent delays and trims mm -hmm. because you're going to have to compensate when you don't have, when you're sitting in the main listening position and you have your subs that are not in the same distance relative mm -hmm. to that location and you use the same channel delay, that could be problematic. But most yeah. of the receivers now, I think, Harrison, I think the price point starts at around a thousand bucks where you get independent subwoofer outs. Yeah, right? just about, I would say, yeah. Uh... So get get a receiver with multiple subwoofer outputs. The room correction can help, um, especially if it's direct live bass control. I think that one has a better yeah. chance out of all three um, that we were talking about in, in compensating for bad subwoofer placement. But ideally, you really want to experiment and get the best subwoofer placements in your room as possible before you rely on the room correction to fix everything. And that involves mm -hmm. some investigative work and hopefully if you're proficient in doing some measurements with rew that would really help as well or talk with you guys because you guys have a home theater design tool i mean you guys mm -hmm. offer yep. a level of service that i don't know of any other online retailer that does so that would be instrumental in getting that kind of support 
Yeah, we have yeah. two articles and two videos, I believe we've made uh, a year or two ago. And, you know, the first one is sort of how to where to place your subwoofer. And we show a couple different, you know, the sub crawl and a couple different techniques to do it. Um, then we also have a subwoofer calibration video, which is, you know, more generic. But again, we have those videos and you can use them as a starting point or in talk with us or you might be all set after you watch those. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, the one thing I don't like doing and I know people are going to probably bash me in the comments. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of near field subwoofer placement. Um, I've experimented with it um, in multiple situations. And even if you get good base integration and it measures well, which it usually doesn't when you're sitting next to that subwoofer, you would think sitting next to a subwoofer, you'd have uniform frequency response, but it usually doesn't work that way. You can still localize the pressure wave of that sub. Um, I could, when I sit in the back row and there's a sub right next to me, I know there's a sub there, it's obvious even though it's crossed over at 80 hertz and the and the frequency response is relatively well controlled uh some tricks when you have a sub really close is you could flip the orientation of the drivers so you could fire the drivers at the wall instead of towards you that could help it actually acts as a high pass filter so it you don't hear all of the higher frequencies from that sub. i'm sorry a low pass filter so you don't hear all the higher frequencies of those subs hitting you as well so you got to be careful. I mean, you really, you got to do listening and sometimes getting a flat graph doesn't give you everything. You have to actually experience how this, how the base is integrated in the room. And sometimes the room correction will change that. Like when I ran direct art in my system before art, I felt like the base was all around me, but after art, it felt like the base was coming more from the front of the screen. So mm -hmm. it, it's perceptual change. It perceptually changed how I was listening to the base. And you have mm -hmm. to determine if that's something that you like, if that's something. Yeah, that well, you that's, like. you know, I think that's a common, it's a common misconception that people say that base is the, the location. Sh it should be omnidirectional is what people yeah. say. Yeah. And it, you shouldn't be able to localize any base whatsoever, which ideally that's true, but base is less directional than other frequencies. It's not that there's no direction to it. It's just less. Um, yeah. You know, and, and you're know, kind of back to the, the sub placement, uh, yeah, we we do help out with that. So you know, whenever I'm designing room sub placements, one of those things that we try to try to focus on initially, figure out where our doors are, make sure I'm not going to open a door into a subwoofer or anything like that. But uh, corner to corner is usually some of the best for uh, consistency of frequency. Mm -hmm. But the issue is whenever you have two rows, the exact same thing you were talking about. You can't really time align those subs to both rows at the same time because that's just not how physics works so generally I, I start out with the front two corners it yeah you know dsp can you know back to the question kind of help smooth out base uh you know a little bit in those in those areas but so the only way um, you're going to get let's be honest for a minute because you, i see some of these forums where they people post their graphs and they only show one mic position or they smooth the hell out of the graph so it looks like a straight line from 100 hertz down to 20. It really doesn't work that way. The only way you're going to get really good, consistent bass from seat to seat is if all those seats are towards the middle of the room. You've got mm -hmm. four equal, you know, you got four corner loaded subs, and you've got a DSP system managing any of the excessive bass and room modes that you need to cancel out. And you still are going to have some compromises. Most people can't put the seats in the middle of a room because then you're going to be too close to the screen, right? And it's and you're going to waste space in the room you start shrinking that room when you when you push those seats forward so you're always going to have a row i think towards the back of the room and that back row tends to be a compromise because it's close to a boundary and you're going to have excessive base below about 40 hertz mm -hmm. yeah no for sure i mean that's uh the seating placement in a room is something that is always a point of contention because there's the the balancing act of not having enough seats versus having too little seats, uh, you know, seats in a proper location. So that's, again, another thing that I, that I work on every day. The real answer but, is get as big of a room as you can, because as you get the bigger the room is, the easier it is to deal with the base problems. Yeah, and then also the more expensive it is to, it to is. amplify. <laughs> but you're, but <laughs> but you're getting away from those, you're yeah. getting away from those boundaries, right? You're getting yeah, you away are. from the back wall, the side walls. I mean, if you ideally, if you had a 50 foot by 30 foot room, that makes that's a lot easier to get good base and then a 12 by 12 room. <laughs> yeah. And then I'll put my uh, my little tiny uh, yeah, bookshelf speakers up at the front of the room and, <laughs> and not be able to fill it. But yeah, because, you know, the bigger the room is, the more more subs you need or well, at least the bigger the subs you need. Um, and more output sure. of your, your, your towers and more amplification. So, yeah, it's you got to scale appropriately.
Yeah, it's a balancing act. Um, so cool. I think we have question. We have time for a few more questions. Let's see. Any jump out to you guys that you saw? I like the one with the ported versus sealed subs. Is there a minimum? Subs? Yeah, let's. Yeah, let's. Yeah. Let me see if I can find it. it. Says Gene, do you like ported or sealed subs? There we go. So I like both. Um, I have, it, it really depends. And we've done live streams on this in the past. Uh, I know Matthew leans more towards sealed subs. James Larson le leans more towards ported. The advantage of ported is you do get more output, um, you know, up to the tuning frequency, you get more efficiency. But one thing that the numbers don't tell you when we do these outdoor measurements is they don't tell you the room gain scenario. So if you have a really good sealed sub that doesn't have an aggressive high pass filter on it and it has a long throw woofer, sealed subs have a huge advantage over ported subs for infrasonics. Mm -hmm. And um, that's another thing I want to do a separate live stream on because I think sometimes people look at a sealed versus ported sub and they automatically want to go to the ported. Personally, I like high output, um, non-aggressive high pass filtered sealed subs. Uh, they tend to be a little bit more musical. They have lower group delay. And again, that advantage you get from the room gain, like I have a 21 in my theater room and my 3DB point is like six Hertz. And that's hard to get from a ported sub. <laughs> it's really hard to get that from a ported sub. So it really depends on the scenario. Um, you can get really well engineered ported or really well engineered sealed. Yeah. But don't discount the sealed sub. The advantage, the other advantage of sealed subs is they tend to be smaller as well. So if you use multiple subs, you put four SB 3000s in a theater room. It doesn't take up a lot of floor space. You get consistent base response across all your mm -hmm. seats and you get some room, you get the room gain advantage of, of the sealed sub. Yeah. Well, in the, the nature of like, you can't, it, it, a lot of people just say, oh, well, all ported subs are boomy. They're made for theater. And that's not the case at not all. True, yeah. 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 There's a lot of really tight, really accurate. Yeah. Ported subs. Um, you know, I use ported subs and in, in my theater, but I use it a lot for two channel. I've got the uh, the HCI twelve hundred P's. Love those subs. I yeah. You know, that's a very the, musical sub. Yeah. Very musical. Yeah, and that's uh, yeah, you know, that's something that people should really consider. Be like, hey, don't just discount something. And say, hey, I'm using a two channel setup. I have to have a sealed sub. Um, look at the measurements, which you know, Gene, you guys measure a lot of these. So mm -hmm. go check them out on there for sure. But I think we have time for one more question. Um, when upgrading a system, should I start with an AV receiver or speakers? So, I, would look at, I would look at your room first and make sure you have a decent room and put more effort into the room acoustics and where you're placing your seats as that would be my first recommendation before you start throwing more money at equipment. And it also depends on how bad your speakers or your AVR are at the time, right? And if you have an AVR that only has component video output, yeah, it's time to upgrade. <laughs> it's time to upgrade. <laughs> no, yeah, no, I, I I agree with that. Um, you know, speakers. When it comes down to something you're going to change out in a room, in my opinion, or in my experience, I think speakers are always the most like night and day shift. If I swap out speakers, yeah. I'm like, oh my gosh, this changed my system entirely. Versus sometimes changing out, you know, power amplifiers or changing out preamplifiers or receivers or anything like that. It can be more subtle. Um, mm -hmm. So generally speaking, speakers are going to be a lot more expensive of an upgrade, though, uh, in, in most scenarios. But they also last longer, right? They, they, they don't do. obsolete. Yeah. They don't obsolete. So buy once, cry once. You know, spend yeah. the extra money on a good speaker because you're going to keep it 10 or 20 years easily. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's something I try to tell people, too, is that especially if you're going with an in-wall speaker, um, just spend the extra money, please, mm -hmm. <laughs> because you're not going to want to go cutting holes in your wall and, and, you know, in two years, no matter what you think you are now, just go ahead and upgrade. If you need to you know, make a compromise on the receiver to do that, you know, maybe consider that obviously don't go to a super cheap receiver, but you know, try to put the money where you're going to want to keep it. So, but awesome. Um, I think that's about all the time we have for a uh, question. So We've got our big giveaway winner and our best question. Harrison, do you want to kick off our uh, best sure. question giveaway? Yeah. For our best question winner, we are going with Niels Toft, who asked the question, if you use Odyssey or similar, that would take care of base management or towers, right? Um, so Niels Toft, you will be getting a Heiko subwoofer from us. 
So make sure you reach out to us or we'll reach out to you and um, you'll get a free Heiko subwoofer from us. I think that, you know, it's not necessarily a Heiko question, but it kind of derailed the conversation into something very interesting and it seemed to get more questions on it. So uh, thanks again for the question. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. And again, everybody, you know, whenever, uh, whenever I host, I tend to go a little bit off the rails and talk about all kinds of stuff. But if you guys do have Heiko questions, always feel free to chat in or call uh, onto our website. You know, our guys are, are all experts. So uh, especially on Heiko. So if you have any questions, feel free to chat in and call. But for our main giveaway winner of the 5.1 package, we have Jennifer Larson in Bentonville, Arkansas, U.S., so uh, awesome. So Jennifer, uh, once you uh, once you get this, shoot us an email uh, or chat in with us and let us know that you won and we will get you set up with your new 5.1. But if you didn't win, everybody, there's another giveaway next month. Let me go ahead and pull that up. A really good one. <laughs> so we are giving away next month the new. Yeah, Gene, I heard you say wow already. Whoa. <laughs> the yeah, the new uh, NAD Master Series M66. So this is a phenomenal preamplifier so uh yeah this is this what's the retail value on this harrison i think it's 5500 okay. yeah yeah yeah, right around yeah, it's, there. Like yeah. A, it's a brand new 5500 piece um i know i sounded like a little bit of a tv personality what's the retail <laughs> on that no but uh this is a really cool giveaway so we've already put that up on the site so i encourage everybody to go and enter that now because that's a really cool piece yeah but um awesome but awesome well Thank you guys for jumping along and uh, you know answering some of these questions and and thank you everybody for submitting your questions in. And like I said, if you guys ever have any uh, that we can help with, feel free to jump in to our website or call us in, and we're happy to help out. But, awesome! Thanks for awesome. having me, guys. All right, thanks, guys. Thanks, you have a great day, you guys.